episode of Brown with Rants, and I'm joined today by Bernard Jackman. Bernard is a professional rugby coach who formerly coached sides such as Grenoble and Dragons. Bernard is also a retired rugby player, having played for Connacht, Leinster and Sale Sharks, while also having nine caps for Ireland. Well, with that out of the way, how are you today, Birch? Very good, Richie. Thanks for, for the opportunity. Well, thanks for coming on, esteemed, uh, esteemed guest. So, before talking about current affairs and the life of a of a rugby coach i'd want to go back a bit earlier to your time as a player and you've you've mentioned previously that warren gatton played a massive role in convincing you that professional rugby was the right sort of lifestyle and the right career path for you so like was he the key instigator to get you to play for connacht and pursue professional rugby when at the time it wasn't exactly clear that it had a pretty promising future ahead of itself yeah i think i've been um I'm very influenced by by two Kiwis in particular. Um, uh, when I left school, I went to school in Newbridge, played SCT, but um, my probably I hadn't played Irish schools. You know, I, I wasn't really on the radar. There was no real Leinster academy. There was a national academy, um, which had about twelve players in it. My generation was Dennis Hickey, Ron Nagar, Peter Stringer. You know, Gervin Dempsey guys who went on to have you know massive careers, but I wasn't certainly on the radar for anything like that. Um, I went it was went to the university in DCU. I was studying international marketing in Japanese. My first club out of school was was Lansdowne. Um, I really enjoyed that. Got to make my AIL debut uh, for them as a as an eighteen and a half year old. And to be honest, that was my goal leaving school was to play try and play AIL. AIL at the time was was big, you know. So some some would say it was bigger than the provincial stuff. And um, you know, my my goal was to to play that. And I got to play in the old Lansdowne Road for. <clears throat> for for Lansdowne in an AIL game with with likes of Eric Elwood and um, uh, Fergus O'Hearn who, who was an Irish international as well against Old Wesley who were Division One at the time, and then that I, the next week I played a seconds game for Lansdowne and Brent Pope was at it to look at someone else. Brent Pope was coaching Clontarf, and I was living in Sandy Mount um, and uh, I played quite well at hooker for seconds that day and. It turned out he was looking for a hooker as well and he approached me in the bar afterwards and asked me would I would I consider so I met him for coffee and he said he wanted to make Clontarf a, you know a division one club um, and obviously I was studying on the north side as well so it kind of made sense there was an opportunity to be first choice there whereas Leinster had made or Leinster had made a guy called Mark McDermott captain for the following year who was a cracking player and ended up playing provincial rugby as well so it was just an opportunity to go and, and I suppose play and uh, at a a lower level but on the first team rather than the second team and um, he just, we had a brilliant year that year with Lantar Pope he made me he really focused on my ball carrying and, uh, and tried to make that a strength in my game and um, I remember that year during the year we played against Goegians in a AIL game and for the last 20 minutes they brought on this grey haired hooker and I didn't know who he was but he absolutely destroyed me at scrum time and I remember we won the game and after the match I said to Popey Jesus that fella and he had a Kiwi accent so um, you know I said to Popey after Jesus who's that lad he, he's unbelievably strong and he said oh that's Warren Gatlin he's an ex all black hooker and he came over to Galwegians to be a player coach um, for them now he was trying not to play he was old he was 37 mm-hmm. or 8 I was 20 and um, the way things work out is hilarious that at the end of the year Eddie O'Sullivan was renegotiating his contract with Connacht uh, fell out with Connacht at the last minute the, Warren had come back to New Zealand the Connacht branch rang Warren and said listen will you come up back over and coach Connacht um, and Eddie hadn't finalised his squad and Warren neither the hooker remembered me rang Popey and Popey gave me a, a good recommendation and I became one of the first guys in Ireland ever to be contracted and uh, the problem was I was supposed to go to Japan uh, so I got a contract in June I was supposed to go to Japan in July um, and that was the big debate, I suppose, with my family and internally myself. To did I want to actually turn down the opportunity to go to Japan for a year, which was going to be six months college, six months work, having spent two years studying for it. But um, you know, the chance to be a pro rugby player or, or semi pro because I continued my studies in a different course um, was probably too good to turn down. And um, and then obviously it kind of came full circle because Warren was probably instrumental in me going to the Dragon. So. Um, it's funny how, how those relationships can, can kind of last and um, can play a, a role in your career later on. Mm. Well, I was quite fortunate, as you said, like of all things, the seconds game gets you into the Clintar setup in the first place. And yeah, yeah. Towards that. I believe, yeah, 100%. I believe that, um, 
you know, by being out there and just like whether it's playing rugby, whether it's um, you know networking for for business, um, you know, uh, whether it's you know even for me coaching, you know, I I, I did our coaching leadership development. Like I, I was down with the weekly GA team last night, you know, on a, on a Tuesday night. Um, just speaking to them and I love it I love being involved in teams and um, I think if you're good enough you know the vast majority of the time there are obviously people who are lucky but an opportunity will open up for you and you, you'll you'll either take it or, or you won't and at that initial stage as you said you had a few options with as you said you studied Japanese you had the idea that you'd go over there and study and spend a year there was there ever a time when you actually committed to the decision of playing with Connacht where you're thinking by God, what the hell have I done? Yeah, yeah. When Warren left, so when yeah. Warren, uh, my first year with with, uh, with Connacht was great. We became the first Irish province to win away in France. We we got to a, a European Challenge Cup semi final, which at that stage for Connacht was a you know was into unknown territory. And we had a really good culture, um, but unfortunately, then Warren, or fortunately for him, he got the offer of the Ireland job, and you know he uh, he ended up doing that for maybe four or five years. And his replacement struggled to kind of build the same type of um, success, I suppose, that Warren had. And we actually became uncompetitive. And it was very difficult. It was difficult times. I was commuting from Galway to DCU in Dublin, trying to finish off my, my degree. Um, it was weird. At that stage, there wasn't a full calendar for the provinces. So we were kind of in Galway for full time for September, October, November, bit of December, and then the matches dried up and you was effectively just back with your club but because I was contracted and full time there was a requirement for me to be down there to do my S&C Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday so um, now they were quite flexible if I had a project or you know a presentation they'd let me back to Dublin but I, at those in those days the, the road to Dublin was you know way worse than it is now it was a four and a half hour trip you know I did a few round trips daily sometimes um, you know waits in the morning went back to college and had to be back that night for um, for, for training the next morning and I, I definitely felt my body wasn't getting a chance to recover properly I, I, you know I was spending too much time in a car um, I was chasing my tail a little bit so uh, with that and the frustrations of probably of there wasn't real clarity around where Connacht wanted to go if you look at Connacht now you know there's a real plan there you know and um, the union have got behind them in a massive way but you know when I left Connacht to go to sail you know, it was while I was in sale that the there was a threat of, the, of kind of closing. So that showed that was in the background before I left. So um, for me, I finished my degree. Connacht weren't really sure about their future, and I had an opportunity to go and play in the what was then the Viva Premiership uh, with a club like Sale Sharks, who who were ambitious at the time. We had a new had a new owner, a guy called Brian Kennedy, who was a uh, a multimillionaire, and you know he signed Jason Robinson, Apollo Perlini, um guys like. Um, Guys like Charlie Hodgson were starting to come through, yeah. Brian Redpath. So it was a good time to go there. And your time at Sale it was quite successful. You got you got the trophy and the honours in the cabinet after that. And first of all, like what what sort of experiences there that you kind of gained with regards to when you came back to Ireland you could really reference to and then also to add on to that, what made you spend you know a few years in sale but then ultimately go you know what I'm actually going to head back to Connacht yeah well, I loved it um, I'm a Man United fan um, we were living um, in sale which is only about 10 minutes from Old Trafford um, good bunch of lads you know I I, I was 21 um, the biggest thing I learned was probably to be, to be more professional in terms of my S&C um, rugby always came quite easy for, for me like the actual game um, but because of all that travel I was doing, etc., um, I never really got a chance to go to be really focused on my on my gym program. So we had a very good conditioner um, who worked with Wigan Warriors and Jason Robinson recommended him, um, an Aussie guy uh, who who put together an S and C program for me. You know, I went from ninety eight kilos to one hundred and twelve um, over two years, and I became. Um, a lot more comfortable in the physical area of the game. I always, um, I always had reasonable speed for a hooker. Um, I had good hands, but you know, I was actually able to kind of be very direct and run over people, which I hadn't been able to do at ninety eight kilos. So that was good. And then, in fairness, I'd gone. To, I'd been in an Irish squad. I went to South Africa in ninety eight with Warren, and when I went to England, 
I went to England when everyone was coming home. So you had a mass exodus um, before professionalism in Ireland to London Irish um, and other clubs throughout the UK. And then when rugby went pro, the IRFU start bringing them back. Mm. But I actually went in the opposite direction at the same time. Um, but that was just the timing. I, they'd already had Malcolm O'Kelly, etc. had had their experience in, in, in England. Um, and likes of Connor Shea and, and, you know, David Humphreys, etc. were over there. David Humphreys went back to Ulster. Um, Mark McCall came back to Ulster from London Irish. So I was just over there, um, concentrating on trying to get better. And then I realized, Okay, I can stay in England. I had a three-year contract offer to stay in England with Sale Sharks, but they wanted me to actually convert to a loose head, um, and I didn't really want to convert to a loose head. And maybe I, maybe I should have. I don't know. I still sometimes wonder would have been would I got more caps if I had of, um, or would have been better for me. But I love playing hooker, and but I decided to turn down that offer and come back to Ireland to try and basically play for Ireland. The unfortunate thing was a couple of deals fell through, so. I had a, a medical with Leinster. I had a bit of a groin problem. And in the end, I actually ended up with nothing, yeah. um, which was obviously <laughs> looked stupid. But I kind of said, well, listen, you know, I'm a way better player coming back from England than I was when I went. If I was good enough to have a contract then, um, you know, I definitely can get one again. So I got a job as a medical rep for a year and backed myself to, to play well enough in the All-Ireland League to try and you know uh, impress whatever the provincial coaches were prove I wasn't um, my injury wasn't going to hold me back and I was rectified and thankfully I did and, and um, at the end of that season with Clontarf um, I actually Eddie Sullivan was the Irish coach he actually brought me into Six Nations squad even though I didn't have a contract which was a big call by him and obviously then that alerted all the provinces and um, I ended up having an offer from, from Leinster and Connacht at the end of that season and you know I, I'm a Leinster man I, I wanted probably to go back to Leinster um, but I had a chat with Eddie O'Sullivan and he said look at you know you're not far away from the Irish squad as it is having been playing all Ireland league but obviously that wouldn't continue um, but Shane Byrne is the starting hooker in Leinster we see him as being number one um, but if you go to Connacht and can become starting hooker there um, you know that's going to be better for you to be playing against him every week so I went back to Connacht it was Michael Bradley became the coach there and you know I did two years there which was my contract and then um, you know then I eventually get a chance to come back to Leinster because Shane Byrne went to Saracens yeah. and was that just good time in regards to heading back to Leinster as you said Shane Byrne went off to England did they have to try and persuade you, or was no? I, I was coming back anyway. I was desperate. Like I, you know, I, I was. Um, I actually left out a bit of story. So, at the time I left Connacht, Leinster wanted me. Yeah. Um, but there was a rule the IRFU had that you actually couldn't move province. This was the early days of professionalism. No one really knew how it would look. Uh, it's a it's a far cry from where we're at now. But a lot of where where we're at now came from some trial and error. So. The RFU felt okay to stop player inflation. Um, you can't, you couldn't. There was an, um, a, a block on moving province. So I was, I effectively Leinster would like to sign me when I finished in Connacht to go to Sale, but I couldn't go there because it was a rule you couldn't move. So I, my in my head I was like, okay, well I'll go to Sale, and then I'll be a free agent when I come back. I can go to Leinster. Now actually, what happened was. I made a decision to go to Connacht because there was an opportunity to play more again. Um, but, you know, I always had one eye on on when I could get to play for, for Leinster because, as I said, that's my home province. And I also felt if I was going to win a, a European trophy, um, that was the, you know, that was, Leinster should, at the time, between 2002 and 2009, you know, Leinster had definitely had a talent to win a, champion, a Champions Cup or a Heineken Cup as it was then. But they hadn't, and I felt well. If I can get up there, and I can, you know, be a first choice for them, you know, we we have a cracking chance of winning the European Cup. Which I was very jealous of seeing Munster have these journeys in Europe. You know, I actually even even when I was in Connacht for that first European Cup final that Munster played against Northampton in Twickenham, we drove in cars like twelve of us, twelve Connacht players, you know, from Galway to to London, and and were part of that kind of, uh, I suppose, um, it was like a cult. Following Munster, yeah, trying to trying to trying to be part of Munster winning it because they were you know so close. Um, but then obviously, I want when you're playing at that level, you want to win it yourself, you know. And that, like when you were at Leinster, you were there for several years, and 
as you were rightfully saying, and I remember Bomber being on the podcast and saying someone like, say, Matt Williams maybe doesn't get the credit he deserves about that transition from having a really talented squad that never really threatened on European stages to then lads like Declan Kidney coming in. And then when Michael Checker came in, it seemed that something started to click and the standards on and off the pitch seemed to have a bit of a rise. There seemed to be much more world-class talent being seen on the pitch wearing a Leinster jersey. And when it gets 2009, pretty mental European campaign, a lot of drama, like Bloodgate. You had a tough pool, if I remember correctly, Wasps wearing it. It was a hard-earned, and I think they fin- you could have finished fifth or sixth in the qualifying to the knockout stages. And it ended up being with that memorable semi-final and that, that Munster Leinster game in Croke Park is still one of the biggest club games in Irish history probably with regards to the magnitude of it also the kind of the passing of the guard as you were saying Munster had been so dominant and Leinster finally stepped up to the plate and delivered and then ultimately beaten Leicester in the final but was there any moment in that 2009 season whether it was a certain game a training session a video session could have been something off not rugby related where the squad kind of well, finally realised that you know we're actually potentially good enough to win this European Cup and yeah I think like if you look at I, I spend a lot of time studying high performing environments and cultures and teams and um, there's a lot of teams who do 95% of stuff really well um, and that year you know Cheka had been there since 2005 he added to you know what you spoke about like some Matt Williams and, and Declan Kidney see the problem is you know, they were starting from such a low base. You know, they had to work extra hard just to put foundations in place. You know what I mean? And I think, I think Cheka then was the one who had, who had probably five years in, 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 uh, in situ, which is a long time as a coach. Mm. But I, that was great. That gave us stability and it meant that there wasn't a, a massive change of, of philosophy. You know, after two years, if you change coach after two years and your head coach comes in, he probably brings a few assistants with him, maybe change the SNC, maybe change the head of medical and, you know, it's not that it's not better. It's just you have to restart to a certain extent, um, and there maybe is that not, lack of cohesion while people, you know, what what things are put in place. Um, we felt that we had broken the barrier and changed our culture a little bit and changed our reputation in 2008. When we won a Magnus League, and we beat Munster a couple of times that year in 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 league games. We won away in Cork. Um, on a on a dirty night, and I remember that for us was massive. You know, for them it was just obviously they were sorely lost to Leinster, but it wasn't the be on end all. They were always a team who peaked in knockout stages, um, but we felt we'd gone down there, and as a four pack, we hadn't taken a backward step. And so, 2008, we won the Magnus League, played some great rugby, and then we signed over that summer. We signed Rocky Elson, Easton Asiwa, and CJ Van Linda. It's probably the most ambitious. Um, recruitment campaign in terms of external recruits that any of the Irish province have ever gone on uh, in terms of number because Issa was you know top class yeah. CJ Van Linda had, had won a World Cup in 2007 a tie for South Africa was a young tie prop now he never got to play to his level because of injury and then Rocky Elson you know was a was a, a player that you know became World Player of the Year or sorry European Player of the Year 2009 and could have played for any club in, in the world or country in the world so that was great. So we came into 2009 season very confident. Um, I remember we started off against Wasps in round one, hammered him. You know, I remember speaking to Sean Edwards about it. Um, you know, during the season, and he was saying it was probably his worst week as a coach because he actually had spent a huge amount of time prepping for Leinster and uh, the Leinster can do this, that, etc. And in the reality, we just beat them up mm. and completely, it wasn't anything to do with our strike plays or our patterns. It was literally just physical dominance and we won by 35, 40 points. And then, of course, you know, hype bills and, you know, we all expected, um, to get out of our group easily, have a home draw. And then we went to cast. So we beat cast at home easily. And it's, it's that round three and four where you, where you go back to back in seven days. And cast with Tarbell in the RDS, and, and it was uh, uh, it was so easy as as it can be. And we were we went over to France thinking, right, we'll go over and get another bonus point, and we lost, and we played really badly, and actually put our whole chance of qualifying in jeopardy. So we'd gone from being one of the favourites to win the Champions Cup to maybe not get out of a group, and it was like same old Leinster. When the pressure's on, they fold. And um, the problem is when you when you play around three and four. Um, you know, it ends. That's the, probably the second week of December. You have a month then 
for the next challenge. So we had to have a real hard look at ourselves. Um, some very honest, um, I suppose, meetings where players call each other out to a certain extent and, and challenge each other, and you know, made it very clear that if we continued the way we to play the way we did occasionally, like we did against Cast, we're not going to achieve anything. We're going to always be underachievers. So, um, you know, around five and six. We did enough to win. Get out. We weren't brilliant, but we managed to knuckle down. We had to go away to Watson and get a losing bonus, um, which is what was required. And we limped out of our group and ended up with, as you said, a, an away draw against Harlequins. Uh, you know, when we weren't really fancied, um, and it was a horrible game. I think it was six seven or, or yeah, six, six seven, six five, six five. That's right, six five. They missed a lot of kicks, and but for us, it was huge to go away in Europe in a quarter final and win. And then it set up the, the semi-final against Munster where we were massive underdogs, but it was an unbelievable occasion. Probably the, well, it was the biggest occasion I ever played in, in in terms of the hype. You know, in, in those days, you're either blue or red. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was it was hatred. You know, it was hatred. And uh, the rivalry had gone out of a little bit, I think. But obviously, I think Munster beating Leinster now Christmas potentially will rekindle yeah. that and the, the nature of the game. And uh, uh, it's probably not a bad thing. Um, but... It's it definitely was a changing in the guard, but again, it's like it's like the Irish team at the moment. I mean, people are criticising the Irish team at the moment to a certain extent. But the reality is, like for a club team like Leinster or you know a Man City or Liverpool, you know they play over thirty games a season, and very few teams maintain excellent form for thirty games. Every team has a blip at some yeah. stage. Unfortunately, in the Six Nations, you've got five games over seven weeks and you got to be on the money um, so I don't think like for us that year 2009 we ended up being European champions but you know there were certainly periods um, where we weren't brilliant but we got enough good results to put us in the hunt at the end of the season and you know we, we played very well against Munster in, in semi-final and then obviously we did we had a good performance against Leicester in the final and, and we won our first European Cup and I think then there's confidence there's self-belief People are used to success. The youngsters see a winning senior team, um, and uh, you know it was easy for, easier for Joe Schmidt to come in then and add what he does brilliantly, which is obviously you know the technical and tactical aspect of the game, and bring Leinster to another level again. But someone had to put the foundation uh, blocks in place, and 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 Cheka and the guys before him probably did that. Pretty pretty comprehensive uh, summary of the old year. And I'd say, unfortunately for you, is just as Leinster were beginning to showcase that ability to perform in Europe, and as you said, they just won the league the year previous, and by beating Munster, that was kind of the hoodoo, or the monkey off their back. And with you, you suffered a few concussions, you spoke about it in your book, you've also spoken about, about it publicly. Like, now in a time, whether it's an under-10s match or an Irish international game, concussion is, it's monitored like there's if in doubt safety first while back then loads of players have said it that it just wasn't managed it wasn't this, the thing it is now today and players were getting bangs and continuing on just probably knowing that they were slightly concussed but saying I don't want to lose my spot etc in some ways are you a bit glad that like you got to retire at the right time I know as you said like Cheka was eager for you to stay on and try play through it but now with the exposure it has and the publicity you get in the media, could you have potentially dodged a quite yeah, serious Yeah, hundred percent. I think I, I was um, I was definitely taking too many risks. Uh, the problem for me was um, my tolerance of impact dropped massively. So, like you know, I've said it before. Uh, I, at that at that stage, two thousand ten, you know, I would have got a concussion in a pillow fight. You know, and, and probably the problem is impacts in in pro sport even though obviously now they're way bigger than they were in 2010 they were still quite physical yeah. and you know so I was even in those days there was a, there was actually a hit in the scrum um, whereas now obviously it's 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 much more controlled it's not that the scrum isn't very difficult but the, that impact from the for the front rows of the engagement has lessened because obviously the space has is, is, take, been taken away but I was getting I remember doing the scrum sessions on Tuesdays and I actually would take a couple of painkillers beforehand because I, I knew as soon as I hit that first scrum, um, that I would, my head would start to spin, and uh, but you knew you had to get through a certain amount of scrums on a Tuesday to be allowed to play. And uh, no one would have known I had like I was 
I, like I remember vicious migraines. Um, sometimes you'd be just hoping, you know, the eight would pick because you, you felt like you were going to pass out, mm. you know. But a concussion can hit you in lots of different ways. Like I, I, I was never carried off the field. I was one, sorry, but I was, you know, uh, back in 2005. But at the end, when I was getting these concussions, I actually would lose a bit of balance. Um, you know, things would blur up. But I knew that if I could just buy myself a couple of seconds, that I would get back to a level where I could operate. And um, it's like a muscle memory a little bit to a certain extent. You, you know, you, there's a lot of things you can do in autopilot yeah. uh, because of the fact you've done them for 15 years. And, and But the problem is, even though you can probably do it, no one can see it, your reaction time, etc., is a little bit less. So that's when you're in big danger of getting a, you know, another big knock through poor technique um, or not being able to react at the right time. So uh, definitely for me, I'm really glad that... So I was one of the first guys to speak out about how prevalent concussion was yeah. and how our attitude to concussion was really stupid in that we had this macho um, or macho mentality around concussion where it wasn't acceptable to lose, to, to not train because of it. If you had a concussion on Saturday, um, at that stage it was a kind of a mandatory two-week off rule, so you didn't play for two weeks. So that's why people didn't want to declare it because... You know, you might feel fine the next Thursday, um, which often you can, but you'd know then that there was no way you could actually play that match Saturday because you'd already been pulled for two weeks. So in actual fact, the old rules, which were probably to protect us um, and you know, probably made sense around you know not playing for two weeks because it was safer, it actually hindered us because we didn't declare the concussion. So I, I, I feel sorry for the docs who I worked with because I, I, I used every excuse under the sun you know, fake, or lost contact lenses, stingers, winded, to just buy myself enough time yeah. so they didn't realize that I had a, a, con- a concussion, whether it was a mild concussion or severe concussion, um, I didn't declare it. Now, thankfully, as you said, it's changed massively. That was 2010, you know, 2019 now, but it's in every sport people are aware of concussion. And uh, I also think that the kids who watch rugby now, professional rugby, they see better example, whereas probably in, in my day, you know, if I was, if my son was watching me play or someone else play, he might see a fella get up, stagger, you know, get some treatment, um, you know, the, the wet sponge and stay on, you know, and that's not a good example, you know, that's not a good example. So thankfully we've, we've moved on. The career comes to an end and you had your highs and your lows. And as you said there, you're quite thankful that you got out when you did with that injury, not so much as a player. You obviously wanted to keep going as long as possible. And like nowadays, you're a coach, but that transition from player to retired player, did you immediately think, I want to get back involved in rugby? I want to start coaching? Or was it a friend who advised you, you know, it should stay in the game? Was it an individual decision or did other circumstances? No, yeah, no, I think um, everyone used to laugh at me because uh, the players used to laugh at me kind of from probably 2007 onwards I was actually actually actively coaching so like I was coaching Newbridge which would be um, you know a Leinster League club that probably some of my mates were playing for because I'm in you know there's a lot of the past people at Newbridge College then I did Cool Mine uh, then I was doing Clontarf then I retired and did St. Michael's um, which was great uh, and the plan for me was always to be a professional coach um, and not really at academy level I kind of wanted to at that stage, I was very focused on, you know, being part of a team, you know, who were measured on a week week to week basis, because um, that was just what I was, you know, used to probably to a certain extent. I think probably now my, um, you know, my last job in the Dragons was probably more around um, probably player development than it was, you know, the the necessity to win every week. Um, so my mind my mind shifted a little bit around that, but um, definitely I knew I wanted a coach and. You know, I was just hoping that I was, I was building my CV while I played. I was always trying to learn from coaches. I've been very lucky. I've had some very good coaches. I was always trying to understand why they were implementing certain tactics or why they ran a training session like that. And, you know, always took a lot of notes. And yeah, I was keen to, to try and do it myself, you know, and I know, knew that I'd have to earn my stripes. And, you know, I, had, I wrote an autobiography the, and it came out the year I retired. I was very lucky RT kind of used me. I went back to UCD and did a, a master's, a coach St. Michael's. Uh, but I knew I had a small window. I probably had a year where that was the year I had to find 
a job in the pro game and thankfully you know that that, ar- that arose in, in, in France with a club called Grenoble who were in Pro D2 You mentioned there that you spent time and you even coached myself and Michaels and like a lot of the listeners will be I'm sure Michaels past pupils Michaels pupils and so on and just to give a bit of perspective on it like that year in 2012 the, the Dan Levy captain side like throughout that year like there was a lot of ups, a lot, lot of downs. I remember some punishments after poor training sessions. A certain hill in Milltown, maybe still branded as Jackman Hill. <laughs> but um, that was the punishment. That was the luxury. <laughs> luxury. <laughs> but that season had its great moments and its bad moments. You had even coaches changing yeah. throughout the year, and you had multiple changes during the cup campaign. But you spent a lot of time with adults in the club game. But by coaching some future pros as I said Dan Levy Ross Burnett there's a huge list there and then also players who are just content of being a part of the team like what what gainings did you learn because at that time you were just initially getting into the pro game but yeah, was there anything I, I think the coaching of school that? I mean if I was uh, if I was to advise any prospective or ambitious coach who hasn't got you know an obvious avenue into into a job I would say get involved with a team in a in a schools cup in, in Leinster. I mean, obviously, I think Munster's obviously Munster is you know is a very high level as well. But I don't know it as well. But um, I'm lucky enough at the moment. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm commentating on the schools game for for free sport and air, and I love it. You know, what I mean, I love the quality of, of rugby. I just think that um, you're never going to have even a professional level unless you're with one of the top teams. A Saracens, a Leinster, um, a Munster, you're never going to have 35 players who are as committed to a, a, a trying to achieve something together. You know, they're unbelievably tight. To, um, they're a pleasure to work with. They're also probably don't have as many flaws or bad habits as, as some of the older players. I'm not talking about a professional level, it's different, but if you were to coach, say, in AIL, you know, you have players who maybe their, their skill set is already formed. And maybe they're they don't have the grow up mindset, so you'll see them at 24, and they won't be very different at 28. Even if they're exposed to different type of coaching, they just um, they don't really improve as much. Whereas you can have a, a 16 year old, um, and the difference in him, you know, on the first of January, um, one year, and, and, and 12 months later, will be absolutely massive. So, and I, I think that listen, I think that our journey that year in 2012. Yeah, right. There was highs and lows. We, we, you know, we were in some very tight battles. We wrote our look at times. Um, 88th minute. 88th minute, yeah. <laughs> but you have to, you have to play the whistle. Um, but how good was it when you win it then? You know, yeah. and that's, you gotta, you can't, I suppose, brick yourself and, and be afraid of making hard decisions or, um, making mistakes to get to where you want to get to. As long as you're doing things for the right reason, um, and, and you're working hard and people stick together. Generally, you get the right results. Not always, but um, I think it was great. And, and so many of that team have gone on to be pros. But I, I, I actually don't even care about the pros that much. You know, they that that they're having their career now. But I think for anyone involved in 2012, you know, they were part of history. Hmm. And um, you know, hopefully Michael's will win it again this year. But um, winning cups is very hard. You know, when there's no uh, you've no divine right to win one, and um, I think it's been proven over the last few years by Michaels with, with probably teams who who had on paper you know a great chance Couldn't of success. Been, so yeah. um, I think that's a moment that as a group we can all cherish. I was actually thinking the other day, you know, we'd have to have a ten year reunion uh, in a couple <laughs> of years and um, have a few pints because obviously you lads were um, I wasn't you weren't drinking this at that stage. So yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously not. So we didn't really get a chance to celebrate it uh, as much as we could have. And yeah, it's it's a fair point you say about having the 35, 40 guys turning up to train and even if they have a bad game, if they get given out to buy a teacher that day, once they're on the training ground, everyone's focused and you're completely right, like I've worked in the club game as well, you could get maybe 50% of the lads caring about training, the other 50% are worrying about a night out or girlfriends and stuff like that, so the fact you actually have coaches and players and even the whole community around you all focus on the one thing it does definitely as a coach anyway it really is a valuable tool to have to be able to push 30 40 guys to the very like maximum of their capabilities and you said there that when you were just finishing off with michaels that's when you started tipping your toes into grenoble and you started out as a bit of a consultant there you build yourself up as a forwards coach and then eventually heading 
um, as head coach. And you feel that that whole gradu like that graduation of consultancy to head coach, that was basically the right way for you to gain the experience required as a head coach, or do you look back and think maybe I could have done another few years beforehand to get myself ready for the challenges that Yeah, I think so. I think um but I think it's very hard to to turn down at the time the opportunity. Um I do think, you know, I think for me probably missed out on working underneath somebody who's gone through that passage themselves. And that's probably something if I, you know, if I was to have an opportunity tomorrow um, to work in a, in a club as an assistant, but there was a very experienced, um, you know, highly qualified, you know, world-class head coach. Well, then I think, yeah, that'd be brilliant. You know I mean? I'm not, I'm not um, overly concerned about my role our title it's more around what the actual team looks like in the support yeah. structure um, but having said that I think it was an unbelievable experience to be a foreigner you know coaching a head coach in the top 14 um, and then obviously as a, in pro sport you know there's a lot of things you need to have on your side and you need to have financial stability and we didn't have that um, at the end in Grenoble our, our, our sugar daddy passed away unfortunately and the club went into a bit of a mess financially try- it's not their fault either it was Effectively, you know, they lost out. They lost out three million that he was putting in, and if you don't have that three million um, at the end of the year, if you're three million short, you, you can go into receivership. And Grenoble had been in that position. They went to the administration, sorry, uh, ten years beforehand, and they got relegated two divisions because of that. So, unfortunately for Grenoble, um, they've been through that, and it took them eight years, no, six years to get back to top fourteen. Um, and a complete rebuild and a lot of good people lost their job and it was a horrendous experience by all accounts and um, I can understand why the um, the board of the club you know tried to get back that three million so that it didn't happen again but unfortunately you know we had to try and get it back through pay cuts and, and cutting costs you know letting people go selling players and that destabilised you know what was a a really promising project you know but that's that's life you know you, um these things happen yeah and uh, I had sports psychologists you're actually an advocate of them Damien Hughes on oh, and yeah. he, he spoke yeah. about how we were talking about Man United and we were talking about how Jose Mourinho came in and he was well he personally it was clear he felt he was the biggest name in the club yeah. and he was nearly bigger than the club and he brought in his own sets of ways his own standards and kind of culture characteristics and ultimately that failed it might have started off well but then ultimately it ended in, in in tears probably and then Solskjaer came in and he pretty much just got the DNA the winning DNA the winning culture of United back on track like little things like all the players wearing blazers playing attacking football no defensive structures stuff like that that Mourinho was so so into so is there a part of you that when you look back on Grenoble when you walked in you talked about trying to change the French culture mm. of Listen, if it's a home game, fantastic, I'm up for it. If it's an away game, listen, get a 16-year-old to go yeah. and talk out. Is there part of you that regrets not kind of, re- I don't want to say respecting, because obviously you respected the culture and the tradition, but is there part of you that thought maybe I shouldn't have tried to change that? Maybe I should have let that slide. Maybe I should have picked my battles a bit wiser. And if lads want to have a few brownies and cakes after training. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think, um, I, 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 listen, I think... I was flexible on some things. Yeah. Um, like I bought into the French way. Uh, you know, we we had a lot of rituals that we we rediscovered actually that were there from twenty years ago that that had drifted out. You know, on the French coaches, so it wasn't like an Anglo-Saxon thing, which you know they often throw at you. Um, I, I, I think there's a very there's a very fine balance between accepting mediocrity and. I know trying to change and drive standards, but um, you have to be very careful as a, as a foreigner in France, particularly. I'm not, not, not just a foreigner, as a, any coach in France, because um, you know the players, the players obviously are at the centre of any project. Um, but it's a fine line between you know pampering them and fine, and also you know managing them and, and pushing them towards success. So the problem was the club, not the problem. The the, the challenge was the club for the first four years said we want to stay up yeah. okay, and we achieved that quite easily um, and then the club which I agree with completely said no we want to be a top six club and if you want to go from finishing 
twelfth uh, or eleventh to finish in sixth, um, you can replicate the same you know type of standards and and, and uh, environment. So we had to try and make it a little more professional. We had to try and change their their mindset and make them more ambitious. And um, uh, when it doesn't work out, you can obviously you obviously second guess yourself. But I think I don't think we were too drastic on it. The, the dessert thing was was blown up in the media but that was effectively I said we shouldn't have the third dessert of the day you know what I mean so we were having pastries for breakfast we were having um, lovely cakes at night <laughs> so I definitely I, I, I enjoy a bit of cake as you can see by looking at me but the problem for me was at lunchtime we were having them as well and I was like look at you know it's a lot of sugar it's a lot of yeah. fat we had a lot of big boys who actually were at one you know we were getting up out of bed at five o'clock in the morning to do you know fat burning sessions on a watt bike and because they were too fat and then we were feeding them cake um, so but you know it was kind of uh, the, the the players revolt around that was at the end of a period where we'd sold two of our best players where players had been were being offered contracts for the following season which were drastically less than they were on so there was a lot of things happening that they weren't happy with and you know, the cake one was a was a nice headline. You know, yeah, it was an easy thing. For easy thing, but it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. I got a, a, a pay, um, French are good at making cake, and I, I said I definitely, I definitely wouldn't stop anybody. Yeah. Ever, yeah. Well, like it is important, and especially now after the French performance against England, you saw Raj like literally pouring his heart out to his fellow uh, analysis yeah. uh, analysts, I should say, that like they don't really get the whole psyche of French rugby and how it's so unique and like literally guys turning up on a Saturday if they wake up feeling good that could be the difference and sometimes a scrum can give away 10 penalties if they're away from home and then three weeks later they play the same team with the same players and it's roles reversed because they're at home and the crowd love it and they're on top of things yeah unless you've worked in France and Rich you've come down to visit Mm -hmm. Grenoble so you've seen you've seen a bit of it and and you you know obviously your friend your friend is down there and so you understand it but on like (laughs) pundits here or reporters or journalists or rugby fans in general struggle to you know they don't we like logical you know they call it Anglo-Saxon mentality and you know if you if you start Monday with a plan you know for Saturday well then you know Tuesday you know what you're going to do Wednesday you know what you're going to do and by Saturday then the plan is, is in place whereas for them they don't like that too much you know what I mean it's a lot about the feel um, the feel the sensation the mood in the camp you know, and as Rod says, it's, it's literally you could have a brilliant week, and whatever reason, you know, there's no reason for it. It's not logical. But Saturday yeah. morning, you're in, you're, you're hoping at breakfast the guys are smiling, you know, and um, if they aren't, or uh, and you sensed a change in mood, well, you know, you're not going to play well. Whereas probably for us, you know, because our processes are quite good and sound so boring, but our processes are quite good. There's more of a there's. A, a better barometer of how you're going to play and the performance are more consistent you saw France against you know against Scotland you know they, they changed the halfbacks and suddenly they're playing this you know yeah. brilliant brand of rugby and they score more tries from drone 22 than anyone else and um, and they're dangerous then but like it's it's mad but then obviously I, I you know I spoke to some of the players I was actually in France I was in Paris for a conference the day after the Monday after England and a French team came back while I was there and um you know, I spoke to a couple of their players and they said that they were shocked England were going to kick the ball a lot. And I was like, well, did you watch me against Ireland? <laughs> and they were like, no, we didn't look at him. And then, I, and then in some ways I was going, okay, are these guys trying to throw the coach under the bus? Which they are, which they were, <laughs> because they leaked some other stuff into the media that yeah, probably was wasn't, was detrimental that they didn't know what position they were playing. You know, the week before, Bahalima said he didn't know who was cap- he was captain. Um, and that's planted for, yeah. for a reason. But... I also kind of said to myself, well, you know, the senior players in that group, the pick and the paras, etc. why did they let that happen? You know, if they knew on it, like surely they, there's an onus on them to at least have watched the previous game, which is obviously Ireland. And if the coaches haven't highlighted that that's going to be an area that could be exposed, well, they could have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think that that's, the, that's probably where, you know, Ireland, for example, like I don't think Johnny Sexton or Conor Murray or Rory Best it would never happen because Joe Schmidt would cover every. Yeah. But if they were in a provincial team, and if Johnny Sexton came back to Leinster and Stuart Lancaster and Neil Cullen had the flu, and were missing for a big week, you can be sure the senior players would make sure that tactically they knew what was going to happen, and that's just the difference. So, but 
you know, France, France, like the, the thing we said, the, the player said to me was, it's World Cup year, we're going to be brilliant at the World Cup. Because they always have been yeah. good at World Cups. And so I they're like, them too. yeah, and it could be, you know, and there'll be more, there'll be better prep because they'll be together from June to, to the, to the World Cup. And they actually probably will spend time doing, you know, some tactical work and technical work, which, you know, you would think is a given, but it's just their way, you know, and they won't, they don't want to change. If they, yeah. if they, if they start playing like a well out machine, the public would have nothing to give out about. It, yeah. And they'd be boring. And they don't want to be boring. They no, want that, they don't want to be boring. They love, they love it. Like, and that's why they love to, you know, in Grenoble, um, I go down to my boulangerie to get bread. And, you know, the week after an away game where we got pumped, he'd be giving out all week. The following week, we'd generally win at home and he'd be happy all week. And it, delighted. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, if, if, like, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting culture. It's fascinating. And, um, as I said, it's very hard to understand how and why and I should live there your time there ended and took a bit of time off and you ended up back across the border in in Wales and taking on the Dragons project which similar to well not completely similar but they had some similarities with Grenoble as in they had some struggles throughout the year they had some good times some bad on and off the pitch and it was seemed as like a, a pretty long term project it was a promising enough club with that and like were you basically was that your only option at the time was there a few other options yeah there's a few other options I think I could have went um, I could have went to top 14 club as a forwards coach and and we kind of just we'd done five years in France and the kids were Ava and Ben were four and six going there um, but then they were 12 and or 11 and five coming back sorry 11 and, and uh, 9 coming back and, and they we wanted them to be in school in Ireland um, and particularly my job is so nomadic and we wanted to go to good schools and, and um, the education system in Ireland is very good um, but we were worried that if we didn't come back till they were 15 or 13 and 13 we'd struggle to get them into those schools because yeah. the, you know, there's a waiting list now and the whole thing has changed back so we said okay well let's get them back to Ireland let's get back to Ireland as a family Let's get them into national schools, in, into schools that they can go to full, the full cycle. And if, whatever reason, we have to move away for a couple of years, at least then they've been to those schools and there's a relationship there. And, you know, we could obviously chat to them about whether they guarantee the place back or whatever. Um, and also, you know, if they, let's see how they enjoy being back in Ireland. So uh, we actually had, I had an offer to go to America. And there was a Pro 14 team in America who was supposed to, sorry, there's a team, a franchise in America who was supposed to join the Pro 14. Uh, it's supposed to be two actually and um, I was in negotiations with one of those and I'd been offered a job pending them being accepted into the Pro 14 and that was a very interesting project because it was actually to build a team from scratch and they were only going to be joining the Pro 14 this September but you had 12 months to basically build a squad and a coaching staff uh, etc um, and that was probably our that was our first option we, you know come back to Ireland for at least a year. I I didn't have to be based in America. I could recruit from here. I was allowed to have you know seventy percent foreigners from year one, and um, it would have been an exciting challenge. And then to go and live in America for two years at least it was a three year contract. And then that that complication started to happen between the the franchise and the and the contract to get into the Pro Fourteen. And then the WRU bought the Dragons, so the Dragons were about to be going to receivership. They've been for sale for five years. Um, they were underfunded massively. And the WRU had a choice. If we don't buy them, they're going to go into receivership. And we're going to have three regions. Okay. Uh, so the problem was that there was no guarantee that the people who, who control the Dragons would accept the WRU offer. Because a lot of those people were Newport Ruby Club fans who owned Rodney Parade, which is our home, uh, which is Dragons home ground. So it's very complicated. But anyway, the vote was won. The WRU took over and they were looking for a new coach and I met them and they sold me a brilliant project in terms of you know bringing Welsh players back from England exiles because Warren Gatlin changed the rules 60 cap rule um, a budget that was going up and up never going to like it was going to take a long time to get to the likes of the Scarlets or the Ospreys or the Blues but a budget that was going to increase incrementally and I suppose an opportunity to be part of a of a national governing body quite similar to the Irish system and I felt 
I felt that probably for me at that stage having that stability I've come from Grenoble where you know we weren't sure if we were going to get paid at the weekend yeah. um, to you know the Dragons under the old ownership was a little bit like that to be honest with you. there was always worries about, about security but with the WRU ownership I felt it was a chance to be in a, a very similar environment to Ireland which I knew and I knew that if you're a player in Ireland you don't have to worry about any of the financial stuff you just basically be the best player you can be and so I took that on decided the kids would stay and Mishnay would stay here in Dublin and I would commute um, and so I had rented a two bed flat in in uh, in Newport and you know uh, just got stuck into it uh, now the problem is you got to try and change a, a, a culture um, from being a I suppose quite a negative culture which obviously I understand why because results were very poor historically over the last five years they'd only won four games the year before I joined um, there was always that worry about whether the, the, the region was going to stay alive and then obviously that makes it very hard for the previous coaches to re- keep their best players so you know the likes of Luke Charters Toby Falatau Dan Lidius etc you know came from the Dragons region but obviously didn't stay there because of, of uh, financial reasons and, and a lack of ambition etc so you know it was always going to be a while to, to change that and also when I joined it was too late to recruit because I, I started in June and you know obviously recruitment is done by then so we were kind of caught a little bit with a squad who maybe were didn't have, didn't have enough strength and depth or didn't have the quality to get, go where we want to go. Uh, so the first year was very difficult, but we just decided to blood a lot of young players. Um, and I think a lot of those will, will have very good careers in Wales. Um, and ended up kind of getting, getting our academy system sorted out. So we ended up having more um, players in the Welsh under 18 team than we ever did, more players in the Welsh under 20 squad than we ever did. And then, Guys coming from our academy into the Welsh national team, fellas like Aaron Wainwright, Leon Brown, Elliot D, uh, winning their first caps, and um, you know, that was that's huge. I mean, that, that that was part of my KPIs. My KPIs were different because we were, you know, we have a budget of four and a half million for players, and the next Welsh region is six point four. Um, never mind the Irish provinces and the and the Scots. Um, we weren't to be judged based on the same like short term yeah. goals of, of of winning the amount of matches that the others are and uh, but a lot of it was about driving players towards the Welsh team so we did that um, unfortunately I suppose the short term results weren't good enough um, there's a massive shift in Welsh rugby now it's called Project Reset and it's very, going to be very difficult for the Dragons to get the budget that probably I felt we needed to be to be competitive and I am innately competitive I want to win and uh, so that started to change a little bit and eventually we just had a really good frank discussion and said look at um, you know if we're not going to go down that route of, of having you know getting towards equality in budget well then it's better to uh, cut our losses now and uh, because I, I, I don't want to be part of that and, and they needed someone different you need to have a different mindset you need to have someone who's willing to be developing for a longer period than I am and uh, so they made a change and you know I, I, I really liked the staff there I really liked the coaches there um, i sorry the players a lot of players there and you know I really hope that they can get this. it's all about a break in the next few weeks but I hope that they can get some real clarity around where they're going over the next five or six years because there's some young players there who need that you know they can't afford to be messed around the careers are very short and you know they're very passionate about the Dragons region and I hope that they get that stability that they need oh, well said and you mentioned there it, it was it was a long term project that was rebuilding to be done and a big thing about Dragons say when I was growing up and I was a young kid they always had well more recently the Falatows and stuff yeah. but they used to have Montgomery and stuff some big marquee players and you were <clears throat> able to do that you even created your own with some of the like yeah. you had Elliot D and stuff for them with the Hibbards and Moriarty's Moriarty. yeah. even the Hensons like you brought in big names that could attract people just from even a media point sure. of view so is a part of you that and I know you said it towards the end of your time as coach like is a part of you that off the pitch there was a lot to be done there was a lot to be fixed a lot to be managed and you said compared to maybe when you were in France you didn't do much as as much coaching as yeah. you probably would have liked. Is that a regress or is that? Oh yeah, well, like I, I, I want to be. I want to be a coach. I want to be a coach. And I want to. I want to try and 
I suppose um, create a really good environment for players, and that's that's in terms of your your organisational plan, and also in terms of your culture, etc. So I don't, I love all that, but unfortunately, and it's not for it's just the job it was. Every job is different, but a dragon's job was different than probably if you go to an Aviva Premiership, a Gallagher Premiership club, none of them are rebuilds. You know what I mean? Um, everything is so. Um, what's his name from the Hurricanes? Chris. Uh, was gone to Northampton. The Northampton co- the, uh, the Hurricane signed the Northampton coach replaced Jim Hamilton. He's gone in there. He hasn't had to set up an academy. Yeah. He hasn't had to create a medical department. Um, uh, he hasn't had to recruit uh, fourteen players and, and you know renew twenty one others and, and bring in staff. So, but that's that's fine. That's just I think it's a once in a lifetime job unless you set up a, a, a team from scratch where you actually have to spend most of your time doing HR stuff. Um, and that's really important. I mean, you're not going to get, in four years' time, if you don't have the HR stuff and the, the structures right now, you're not going to be any better. You might have the odd short-term win, but, you know, there's a, you know, uh, Damien Hughes says success leaves clues. And, you know, the successful teams have certain things that are, are are consistent across all of them, um, and part of that's having a you know a sufficient number of people working working to provide the right environment, but also them having a certain skill set. And you know it's hard to attract them to, to dragons because you know ideally you want to get people from successful environments who know what good looks like to come. So I brought in a head of medical from Warrington Wolves. Um, you know, I brought in a backs coach from Bath. Uh, I brought the head analysts from Extra Chiefs, uh, people who were already in successful environments who who bought into the chance to basically build something in the Dragons. And um, when you're not when you're not able to offer them, you know, some of them had to take pay cuts, so you have to sell that to them, and that takes a while. And you got to they got to convince their wives and uh, and their families because you're 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 basically they're putting their trust in. In, in you and, and the chance to do something. And I think that's massively motivating to, to be able to put people together. And I think that's the, that's probably why I'm, the regret I have is that we haven't got the chance to finish it. But I hope someone, I, I don't care, it's not me. I hope, I hope it gets finished. I hope that they can uh, get that clarity around budget. Because in fairness, you know, you can do things on a small budget. Uh, but you got to be very patient. You got to be lucky. You know, there's a, there's a, I think there's a minimum you need to be able to compete, and um, I hope they get that. Yeah, and I suppose one of the, the last things I want to cover is you've spent, you've had different roles within professional environments, but your last two have been head coaches, and I always find it interesting that whether you're in football, whether you're in American football, rugby, you name it, any team sport, most coaches have identities with regards to how their team plays. So when I think of Richard Cockrell, I think of gritty, hard work and honest group. If you want to think of the All Blacks, clinical, great brand of rugby, South Africa, physical, etc. Like what, what do you like to associate with say a Bernard Jackman coach team in an ideal world? Or do you kind of, as we previously discussed, see what the talent is, yeah. see what's best fit for them to play. Yeah, my natural inclination would be to play and play um, uh, play from deep if it's on and, and give players a license to make that. Um, but you do need to have a skill set to do that. And I think that in performance sport, it's very different than development sport. So, um, you know, players will get judged by by the results, by um, the amount of errors they make. And I think if you're overly ambitious in terms of what you're asking to do uh, given that we're up against world class players um, on a week in week out well then you're not doing right by them so I think you got to take a step back and actually probably limit that ambition um, to give them a better chance of of being comfortable you know and it's not, I think there's times when you need to be uncomfortable but um, you don't want to be stressed overly in games and if you're trying to get them to play outside their skill set are probably that's harsh because we definitely have players who could do it but the problem is if you if you don't have enough of them you know if there's one guy who doesn't have the skill set well then that can jeopardise the, the chance of being successful so uh, for me I think I, I, I become more pragmatic uh, in terms of in terms of that um, but if you said to me you know open checkbook put it together a team um, I definitely want to put it together a team who can who can play and, and entertain and, and you know score great tries mm. I suppose the last last thing I'd like to ask is 
like you've had your time, your time off, and as you said, you visited France. I'm sure you're planning to visit many other setups all over the world. Like in an ideal world, do you want to get back, be a head coach, or as you said, would you like to work under a really experienced head coach and maybe focus on forward work, defence, or attack? Or is it more of the case of whatever club, whatever team has the right vision that matches my personality and my own vision, I'll be willing to get on board with it? Yeah, I think that'd be more about that. I think for me, I like people. I love I love meeting people. I love trying to, to work with people to achieve something. Um, so probably that, and that's probably what, you know, maybe got me, maybe it made me, veered me towards making a bad decision of Dragons to go there. But um, I do enjoy a challenge. Um, you know, probably career-wise, I probably need to make a, a safer bet next time. Um, but I, I still think that my natural inclination is that um, I said I, I like working with people. So if I, if I found myself having the opportunity to work with some people that um, I really believed in and, and taught, you know, had good values and, and you know, were, were motivated to, to, to do something together, um, I'd find that very hard to turn down. Um, I suppose I'm quite lucky in that, you know, RT have been very good to me. I, you know, there's lots of media opportunities at the moment because of the Six Nations and um, because it's World Cup year. Um, you know, that, that will kind of, there's going to be two cycles for coaches probably opportunity is going to be a cycle now in June at the end of the domestic season and then it's going to be a cycle post World Cup so um, I, I'm lucky enough that I'm not in a massive rush I don't have to take the first job that comes up and um, yeah I'm, I'm excited to, to to see where 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 we get back on track mm. and is, is your mindset going towards that one of excitement because the life of a coach it can be great and it can be also very tough when you have big losses or you you leave clubs for whatever reason like at the moment do you feel as an individual that you've got so much more to prove do you feel a bit under pressure do you feel quite relaxed um i'm, I'm definitely under pressure i've got, I've got to prove i got to prove um my value you know but i think there's very few coaches um who haven't had a setback and but like you had your good days as well. Oh yeah, no, I had great days. Yeah, no, no, I understand. We, like we've, you know, we 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 beat Toulon, we beat Clermont, we beat yeah. Toulouse. So I've had I've had some very good days. Um, but in terms of, you know, so Stuart Lancaster, who's a phenomenal coach, a phenomenal leader, you know, he's had a bad experience now yeah. at a higher level than me. You know, Warren Gatlin got let go by, um, uh, by. Ireland um, Richard Cocker got sacked by Leicester you know so there's very few of us out there who haven't had um, a setback but it's about actually learning from it it's about um, sometimes understanding look at you know Graham Henry couldn't have done in that situation you know some of the jobs that are just very very difficult and uh, I think one people in the industry we all know that and, and we know who's who's who has a, a, a full deck and who doesn't but um, for me I'm definitely under pressure but my head is clean now I think when uh, I've had this break has been great I've, I'm studying a lot of rugby um, and I'm doing it from a different point of view sometimes when you're in a rat race of, and a marathon of week to week you know you're just focused on the opposi- on yeah. opponent and you're trying to find out a lot about them and, and, and that's obviously good but when you're when you're not preparing a team for that match you can actually look at it quite differently and um, I'm enjoying meeting other coaches other, across other sports and uh, yeah just trying to get better quickly and um, yeah I'm definitely f- mentally I'm, I'm in a really good place for for next challenge good to hear and it is important when you're in the heat of the moment and I can only imagine as a professional coach you're under ex- extreme pressure you have to deal with loads of players loads of expectations fans, media mm-hmm. coaches to be able to kind of sit back and look at the local trends or look at even say what the professional teams are doing and like one week it's new attacking structures are in place and there's a huge emphasis on defence and now if you look at say England they've brought a new attacking kick, kicking system that seemed to revolutionise their team so there's definitely a huge amount to be learned by just having that viewpoint of watching games and as you said you do punditry work which only gives you more of a platform yeah. to expose yourself to that but that more or less wraps up the the formal part of the podcast and I traditionally just finished with a few quick fire okay, questions yeah. uh, nothing too controversial All anyway right. but we can uh, bang them out and uh, let you enjoy the rest of this good day so question one is what is the strangest thing you've seen as a rugby coach <laughs> um jeepers um 
I'll come back to that one. Okay. Uh, your favourite film of all time? Favourite film of all time? The Star is Born. Okay. Don't think it did too well at the Oscars. Not too many people were happy. <laughs> but uh, the toughest player you've ever coached. And when I mean toughest, I mean like grunt, physical, etc. Hardest working, toughest guy. As a coach, Hibbard is, is very tough. Um, very physical, great scrummager. And, you know, he's still playing every week. Having, you know, having trucked it up for for whatever, uh, 12 years at highest level. You know, he, I have a lot of respect for him. Hmm. Um, who will win the Rugby World Cup? I think I think England will be far away, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I think New Zealand obviously are very talented, but I, think, I like the way England... And I don't think... I like the way England have set up this year. I think um, I know some of their backroom staff. I know Eddie Jones. Um, they're going to be in a good place. And what happened to them in Wales would only help them, mm. to be honest. I mean, they're, they're going down a different route in terms of how they want to play. And getting found out, you know, six months out is better than actually getting found out in the semi final or final. And that's that's kind of what's happened to New Zealand up to the last two World Cups where they've gone in looking impeccable and um, you know, they've hit a hit a roadblock in a tournament and you don't have a chance to recover then. So I think England England will be I think Ireland will, be, will definitely be there thereabouts, but I think England might just have um, a bit more power than us. Hmm. Had an English journalist on Charlie Morgan. He yeah, spoke about good. John Mitchell and the impact he's yeah. had. And I always thought when I was looking at Eddie Jones during their slump, I was like, if they could just get a Jake White, a really experienced type of guy, to come in, assist him, be that kind of bit of the good guy on the yeah. shoulder, and Eddie can be the bad guy, that will go a long way. And from all the reports and everything I've read, he's made a huge difference both on and off. The yeah, pitch. and the breakdown, like the breakdown last year was. Was catastrophic Campbell's against Scotland. Uh, yeah. Against Scotland, uh, all the Six Nations in the Viva Premiership, or sorry, the Gala Premiership, when they got exposed to the European Cup competition, they, they were poor. And I think he's put a massive focus on that. And I think that'll drift back down into the club club game because now there's you know very clear um, KPIs and, and expected standards around the breakdown. And I think he's brought in a, he's brought in the head of S and C from Warrington Wolves, a fellow called John Clark, who's a real people person. Uh, but not afraid to stand up to Eddie and tell him you know you're overtraining these guys and he's brought in a guy like Scott Weismantle who I know from France who worked with Eddie in Japan and another great people person so you know he's he's changed up new voices as well you know uh, it can get stale sometimes and probably Eddie just cracking the whip for two years obviously led him to 16 wins in a row but you know then they obviously hit a bit of a blip and the RFU have given him the back end to change his staff a year from World Cup with quality practitioners. And I think that's why, you know, you're seeing a, an improved England. Mm. What is the worst advice you see or hear being given in your world? Um, I think don't do that or don't go for that or, um, or you never, you never be able to do that. You know what I mean? Um, like a lot of people told me, oh, you never get a job in France because you're a foreigner. You don't speak French. <laughs> um, and in fairness, I didn't speak French. Um, but I still, you know, I was able to convince the president in an interview to give me a chance, and I was able to go over there and impress them. So, um, yeah, I think the world, you can do anything you want, you know what I mean? Um, and, like, for kids, I think it's really important that, you know, we don't dampen their natural enthusiasm and ambition. And I'll go back to the first, first one. See. I think it was probably a Penguins oh. tour. Um, we had a court session, and effectively we had to have 28 of us in a room uh, with a lot of beer and the dress code was um, sumo wrestling so uh, we had 28 uh, different nationalities with basically nappies on made of our, wow. of our bat towels probably that's the, the strangest sight but it ended up it was a good night yeah, yeah. I was imagine so <laughs> it was a good night and last but not least uh, describe yourself in three words um, resilient persistent and ambitious well said so Bernard that, that wraps it up I want to say thanks a million for spending your time spending your afternoon here chatting all things yourself and rugby and I speak on behalf of the listeners and those that know you we're looking forward to hopefully seeing you out in the dugout pretty soon and yeah. we wish you well really enjoyed it thank you Richie no worries